Hello and welcome. Today I would like to show you something very exciting. A long time ago, probably now almost two years, I bought a box with the retro mainboards and this board was among that stuff. Well, as I looked through the pile, I stumbled upon this one and found it especially interesting. This board was almost screaming in my face to make a video about it. So I stored it in a to-do box where it had to wait until today. So, what's so interesting about it? Let's take a closer look. It is a Data Expert EXP4349 mainboard in revision 1.0. At the first glance, it seems to be a simple 486 mainboard with ISA and VLB expansion slots. Here is the CPU socket 3. It has three VLB slots underneath, nothing special so far. However, let's see what else we have around the CPU socket. Here we have another two unpopulated sockets. One is marked as AT387 and another one as AT386. And indeed, the used ALI chipset M1429 belonged to a bridge technology between 386 and 486 hardware. This chipset was used on mainboards for both CPU generations. However, some manufacturers went even further and produced mainboards where both CPUs could be used with. Of course, not simultaneously, but still, it was an economical way to provide an upgradable system to the users. Not only could they save some bucks reusing the old and expensive parts, also PC manufacturers could use the same base to provide wider range of different configurations for every pocket. Ok, economical benefits were nice back then. But what is so interesting about it for the retro enthusiasts today? Well, first of all, it provides those VLB slots, which were actually introduced with 486 and were not available for a 386 originally. But why did they exist at all? Well, the ISA bus, those black slots, were introduced with the very first IBM's PC XTS 8-bit slots. They were later extended to 16-bit on A286 and continued their existence until early 486. Unfortunately, the architecture of the ISA bus was very simple. It was limited to 8 MHz and theoretical throughput of 16 MB per second. However, real throughput was around 5 MB per second. As long as the CPUs were slower, that was sufficient. However, with 486, this started to be a heavy bottleneck. Especially for graphics card as I showed it in my December 2022 video. This was a really big issue, and so for the faster 486 CPUs, a VLB bus was introduced to overcome the throughput limitations. The VLB bus had double the bandwidth with 32 bits, it was bound directly to the CPU and worked with the full frontside bus clock of the CPU, means 25 to 40 MHz. In some very high quality boards, it could even reach 50 MHz, however, due to direct connection to the CPU with higher clock, the system often got unstable and ran into compatibility issues. VLB was later replaced by PCI, which should fix all the problems, but this is another story. Let's get back to our today's star. As I said, this board provides VLB slots and theoretically should support 386 CPUs, which would be interesting to see running in combination with a VLB graphics card. But how should this work? As I said, VLB was introduced for the 486 CPUs and was heavily relying on that. Other CPUs were missing various signals and couldn't talk with VLB directly. This is where the ALI M1429 chipset comes into play. It acts as a controller between VLB and the CPU. The benefit of such a solution is that even 386DX CPUs would be able to talk with VLB hardware. Also, it should act as a buffer providing at least theoretically higher stability. The downside is then, of course, that such a controller in between of the CPU and the VLB slots slows down the communication due to additional overhead. However, today I hope to see some numbers and especially would love to see if running a 386 with VLB would give us any performance improvements over a pure ISO solution. So, to be able to test this mainboard with a 386 CPU, I will have to solder some missing parts, like the CPU and FPU sockets, some jumpers and so on. 
This will hopefully give us an option to use a 386DX in here. However, if you think that this was the whole secret of this board, I just started. Not only does it support 386 and 486 CPUs with VLB, no, if you look at the unpopulated solder joints near the CPU socket, you will find some options for the voltage regulators. So with some tinkering, this board should be also able to support later 3 volts 486DX4 CPUs at 100 MHz, or maybe more. Just imagine one board which can handle everything from an early 386 to late 486. Even better, the installed socket 3 has the overdrive pin and should even accept Pentium overdrive, which I unfortunately not have, but running benchmarks for such a huge range of CPUs on the same board is really exciting. At least I never saw a main board before which would support both 386 and 486 in 5 volts and 3 volts variants. Hopefully my plan works as expected. Okay, let's move on and look around what has to be done to get it back to life. I already found it on the retro web and printed the manual, which I will need since this board has huge amount of jumpers. The good news is that there is no battery leakage at all. The reason for that is that the battery used is lithium one and not nickel metal hydride. However, the battery is not rechargeable and is probably already dead, but at least we have no corrosion damage. Next point are the first two memory slots. The plastic holders are broken on both sides, so the slots have to be replaced. I think I will change the broken memory slots, but it is actually not necessary, since this board also has 72 pin memory slots, which are ok and which I'd like to use anyway. However, it is good to have all 30-pin SIM slots intact in case I'd like to use this mainboard for experiments with different memory modules. Yeah, I mentioned already the missing 386 CPU and 387 FPU sockets, which I will have to add as well. This will be already a lot of soldering work too, but here comes something which I don't know what to think about. This board seems to be of good quality. The manufacturer used good memory slots, good CPU socket, lithium battery, which was not common at all back then, and now comes this. Look at this VLB slot. It looks like it was ripped off the board, right? But if I flip the PCB and look from the other side, do you see those solder joints? They look like new, like they were never touched since the day of production. And though the VLB slot is half out of the PCB and I really don't know how this could go through the QA. Maybe someone was already trying to remove it with hot air, but I don't think so. For me it looks really like it was manufactured that way. Unbelievable. So I'll have to desolder the VLB slot as well and solder it properly again. Well, this wasn't everything what is unusual about this board. Look at the cache ICs. This board has 4 ICs, 64 kilobytes each, and 256 kilobytes in total. What's unusual about them? Look how SRAM ICs look like, which were usually used in 3 and 486 systems. They were in a much smaller DIP28 package. Those wider DIP32 SRAM ICs are very rare and existed with up to 128 kilobytes each. Means this board can theoretically accept up to 512 kilobytes of level 2 cache. However, on the right side we have here also normal DIP28 sockets and under the wider DIP32 SRAM ICs there are also narrow DIP28 sockets. So instead of those 4 DIP32 ICs, also 8 DIP28 ICs can be used. Interestingly, the cache tag IC is not located near the other cache ICs, but rather near the memory slots. That is a little bit unusual and strange design. Ok, before we start the solder work, let's see if this board is alive at all. I checked the jumpers and they are set for a uh, 486DX, so let's just try to insert one DX266, that should work, and see what happens. Also a small PC speaker, the post analyzer and the power supply.
Okay, looks like some numbers are running. And it's beeping, probably because of the missing memory. But I would say the board is alive to some extent. So let's do the repairs first and solder the missing sockets. If I have to desolder a bigger parts with a lot of pins, like a VLB slot, I usually use in addition to the desoldering pump also a hot air gun to keep the PCB warm. It's also quite cold in my workshop currently and otherwise the desoldering gun is not able to get through all the layers. Uh, should you want to do it in the same way, don't heat up the PCB too much though to avoid any damage. Just keep it very warm, so the bigger ground planes don't eat the heat from the desoldering gun too fast. If you give some flux and heat up the closed soldered holes with the hot air to about 200 degrees Celsius for a short period of time, you can easily clean all the holes using the desoldering pump in one go. Just slide with the tip of the nozzle over the solder holes to give them the required heat directly. This saves a lot of time, but try to make it as short as possible. As you see here, some plastic pins already started to melt. When removing ICs, slots or parts with multiple pins always wiggle the pins after desoldering. They all have to be free, otherwise you would rip the insets out of the solder hole when trying to pull the parts with force. If some pins are not moving freely, add fresh solder to them and repeat desoldering again until they are free. Don't apply any force when removing parts. Here I have some uh, replacement memory slots which I rescued from another donor boards and memory adapters. The 387 socket which I have is closed in the middle, but under it there are some capacitors on the mainboard which could be shorted and which I'll not be able to reach again after the socket is placed. 
I'll double check that the capacitors are not shorted before I replace the socket. Now let's remove the battery. It is probably dead anyway. Oh, you know what? It's hard to believe, but the battery charge is still as good as new. I probably should have had tested it before desoldering. Well, I think for now it can go back in place. Why wasting anything, right? So, the sockets, memory and VLB slots are all in place. Now we have to take care of some jumpers. The manual mentions all kind of supported CPUs and a 386DX is one of those, which is promising. On the related page, all the jumpers which have to be set for the 386DX are listed with their locations and looking at the board, we will see that most of the jumpers are hardwired for 486 CPUs only. So I'm going to replace the jumper wires with real jumpers now to be able to set them as required for 386DX CPUs. I place the jumpers in the way how they were hardwired previously for now. The jumpers, which are CPU clock related, I replaced with green jumpers so I can easily locate them during my experiments. There are also two blue jumpers now, I will talk about them later, and a pile of black jumpers which are all related to the CPU type setting. All missing jumpers for the 386DX are now added as well. Ok, let's add the CPU again and see if the board behaves the same so far. Yep, it seems still to give us some post beep codes. Let's add some memory and a graphics card and see if we will get an image. And yes, it's alive indeed. However, I'm getting a 486DX2 at 75 MHz. That is a very strange frequency. Maybe this is just a BIOS issue. Let's add a keyboard and an IDE controller with a compact flash card and try to boot into DOS. Ok, keyboard works. We are in BIOS. I have no floppy connected. Let's set up the hard drive, aka compact flash card. Auto detection seems to work properly. Let's take a short look into advanced settings. Ok, here we have a lot of timing settings and looks like we can also overclock the ISO bus. Nice! And wow, here we have a huge amount of chipset settings. Looks like we have a big opportunity for experiments. How exciting! And DOS is booting fine. Let's go directly into the CPU identification utility. 
Ok, it looks like the front side bus is set to 40 MHz instead of 33 MHz. The CPU is overclocked to 80 MHz effectively. The good news is that it can handle that clock, but for now I would like to get down to the stock frequency. Ok, off camera I played a little bit with jumpers and that didn't change the clock at all. Didn't matter which combination I used. Well, it turned out that due to the bad copy of the manual, I mixed JP33 and JP39. As you can see, in the manual the jumper 39 can be easily understood as jumper 33. And this is what I unfortunately did. This block of jumpers is JP39 and this one is JP33. So I moved the green jumpers to the JP39, which was previously set to 40 MHz in D. What eventually corresponds with the sticker on the bottom, 486DX40, probably the CPU which was originally used in this board. And as soon as I set the bus clock to 33 MHz, the DX2 was probably detected at 66 MHz. The first thing I looked at was Season 4, where I got only 132 points instead of 144, which we normally should get from a DX266, but this is probably due to very conservative BIOS settings, and there were a lot of them, if you remember, so the chance to get to some better values is quite high. But let's check first the solder work. To test the VLB slot, I will use a Saurus Logic VLB graphics card. And I am glad to say that the video output works, and in Landmark there are over 10,000 characters per millisecond, uh, which means that the VLB bus is working. With an ISA card we usually get something between 3.5 and 4.5 thousand. And my ultimate test, Doom is working as well. So at least the VLB slot is fine and soldered properly now. Ok, now the most exciting test. Let's see if the board gets initialized with a 386DX. For that purpose I'll use an AM386DX40 and let's go with Cyrix FPU for example. Ok, um, on the pins we have some voltage. Let's insert the CPU. Now the new and shiny jumpers have to be set accordingly. And yay, our 386DX is working indeed. It shows 33 MHz for some reason, despite that I set it to 40 MHz, but it works. The CPU identification confirms 386DX at 33 MHz too. And sysinfo shows us weak 26.9 points, staying for far behind expected 35.9. But well, again, this can be properly tweaked in the BIOS. Now let's see if the FPU socket is alright. Hmm. Landmark detects the FPU, but it seems to hang trying to benchmark it. Let's see if Check It can handle this. Nope, it hangs as well. Ok, let's try another FPU, ULSI. If I remember right, I already had some issues with that Cyrix FPU in another system. And here we go, FPU works as well, so the soldering work wasn't half as bad. Now, remember this number of characters per millisecond on this used ISA WDC VGA card, which is by the way one of the fastest ISA graphics cards. 
3437. Now let's replace the ISO graphics card against the VLB one, which I used previously. And it works! In Landmark we are now getting almost 3 times as many characters per millisecond as before, over 10,000 instead of 3.5. So the first question, if a 3T6 can benefit from VLB, we definitely can answer with yes. In my December 2022 video I showed some benchmarks on 3T6 and 4T6 systems and compared also VLB to ISA in Doom. And today with this board we could answer another interesting question. How good VLB performs against ISA on a 3T6 DX? If you are curious to see how far we can drive this exciting mainboard, please join me in the next part where I would like to talk about bias tweaks, issues and further upgrades of this board. I already made some tests of camera and trust me, the results are more than impressive. So far, thank you for watching. And goodbye.